Well, uh, great to see everyone today. What a terrific crowd. Uh, for those of you watching on the live stream, there's another 75 or 80 people out in the ante room outside, uh, which is a sign of uh, respect, admiration, both for our main guest today, but also for two other very important people who are here. And I'm going to start uh, today before introducing Professor Wood, who is obviously our headliner for the day, with a, a pretty important announcement here in the life of the center and an acknowledgment of two very special people for us. Um, today, we are conferring the Gerald Belisle's chair in presidential studies on Barbara Perry. Um, <laughs> As you might guess, the Gerald Belisles chair is named in honor of <laughs> Gerald Belisles. <laughs> um, Governor Belisles, who's with us here today, um, my predecessor here at the Miller Center, uh, has been an extraordinary leader, not just for this institution, but in the state and in the nation. Um, and it's, it's a true pleasure and honor to get to do this here today. And we wanted to pick one of our biggest and most important events to do it, and um, we're really thankful to Professor Wood that uh, he's willing to, uh, to share the stage today with this important event. Um, Jerry's quick biography, he was born in Patrick County, Virginia, educated at Fishburne Military School. He has a bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University. When I think about a military preparation in Wesleyan, <laughs> I, I, I think it helps explain why Jerry is so popular across the political spectrum in the United States. Uh, and then a law degree from the University of Virginia. Um, he's joined Virginia Attorney General's office uh, and worked, among other things, in environmental law, won a seat in the Virginia House of Delegates. In 1981, was elected uh, Attorney General. In 1985, uh, and just to date myself, I was a student here at the University of Virginia when he was elected governor. Uh, and during his term as governor, he appointed the first woman to the Virginia Strait State Supreme Court. Uh, which is, uh, is fitting today as we go through Barbara's biography in a second. Uh, he had legislative initiatives on transportation, the improvement of roads, seaports, airports, and mass transit programs to fight illiteracy, uh, efforts to end pollution of the Chesapeake Bay, and he chaired the Southern Growth Policies Board, the Southern States Energy Board, and the National Governors Association. His expertise uh, continued in aviation and trade when he became a partner at the law firm of Hunton and Williams. Uh, and as my predecessor here at the Miller Center for eight years, uh, he was the fourth director to head the Miller Center. He oversaw the launch of our national discussion and debate series. Uh, he assembled the National War Powers Commission, uh, which led to the National War Powers Report. And as you may have seen or have attended, uh, just uh, less than two weeks ago, Senator Tim Kaine, who has been advocating in the last decade for, uh, for the passage of a uh, new War Powers Act, patterned word for word on the document that came out of there. And uh, Senator Kaine has done this in a bipartisan ma uh, manner with uh, Senator McCain and also with Senator Corker. Um, Jerry also pulled together the Mortimer Kaplan Conference on the World Economy. Uh, the David Goode National Transportation Conference, Policy Conference and Report, uh, which was handed in a Rose Garden ceremony to President Obama, and the Milstein Symposiums here on a series of efforts on the American economy. Um, before going to Barbara, I do want to thank some of the supporters, including Miller Center Governing Council members who are here, who helped endow the Gerald Belisle's chair as an endowed chair of the university, it is a permanent chair uh, whose, uh, whose endowment is held in the endowment of the Rectors and Visitors Fund here. And that's, that is a true high honor that a number of people worked hard to happen, uh, including especially uh, Joseph and Rosemary Erdman, uh, Joe and Sally Gladden, Fred and Mary Buford Hitz, Dan and Lou Jordan, Fred Scott and Karen Turner, Suzanne and John Whitmore, and I also see Alice Handy, Joe and Sally Gladden, um, and any other governing council members here. And I see Dave Martell as well. Um, well, Fred and 
uh, I, I'd already Fred mentioned Fred and Karen. Any other governing council members here? Uh, saw Suzanne. Uh, well, thank you all for making this possible. And I think we owe them a round of applause and support. <laughs> the first holder of the Belisles chair is uh, Barbara Perry, who, if you know Barbara, know that she is the life of the Miller Center. She is the co-director of our Presidential Oral History Program and is the director of Presidential Studies. And the holder of the Belisle Chair uh, will be the director of Presidential Studies. That is what we are designating it for. Barbara has authored uh, 12 books on presidents, first ladies, presidential families, including especially the Kennedys. Um, but her true love is the Supreme Court and its relations to the other branches. Uh, it's what she did her dissertation on. She was a Supreme Court fellow um, and also a focus on civil rights and civil liberties in that. But just to name, mention a few of her books, I've got two of them here with me, which I use today as the occasion to get signed. Uh, these are edited volumes on Bush 41 and Bill Clinton's presidency that come from our oral history program, which uh, Barbara manages. Uh, she's also written on Rose Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, which is a book that's forthcoming, uh, as well as The Priestly Tribe, The Supreme Court's Image in the American Mind. She's conducted more than 100 interviews for the George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush oral history projects. She produced research for the Bill Clinton oral history project. Um, and she directed the release of the Edward Kennedy Oral History Project. As I mentioned, she has served on the U.S. Supreme Court as a fellow, uh, where, among other things, she helped uh, Justice Rehnquist work on a number of speeches and other projects. She's worked for both Republican and Democratic members of the Senate as well. Um, if you turn on your TV today, you will see Barbara on these channels, CBS, PBS, CNN, C-SPAN, MSNBC, NPR, last week on Fox News at the funeral of Barbara Bush, uh, PRI, BBC, Canadian Broadcasting. It goes on and on. Um, uh, she, her name is regular, she's regularly quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Andrea Mitchell Report, the Sunday Times of London, USA Today, Politico, the Daily Beast, the Associated Press. Um, Barbara has a PhD in government from the University of Virginia, a master's in politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford, and a BA, and you know that she has her BA if you've seen her car and her license plate from the University of Louisville. Uh, Barbara still cannot attend UVA Louisville basketball games here. No matter how hard I try to give her my ticket, she will not take them. Um, before the Miller Center, she was the Carter Glass Professor of Government and the founding director of the Center for Civic Renewal at Sweetbriar College. Um, she, in 1994, received the Justice Tom Clark Award for Outstanding Supreme Court Fellow that year. Um, she's briefed more than 3,000 visitors to the court from 70 different countries. Uh, she's a senior, she was a senior fellow for civics education at the University of Louisville's McConnell Center. Uh, and she is still currently a non-resident senior fellow. Um, she's participated in so many different programs at the Supreme Court, at the State Department, the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History. And uh, from 2010 to 14, she was an adjunct faculty member at the Federal Executive Institute here in Charlottesville. She's received awards from uh, the Virginia Social Science Association, uh, from the Sons of the American Revolution, and the University of Louisville's College of Arts and Sciences. So it's with real pleasure that today we get to give Barbara the Belisles chair. And it actually comes with a chair. So <laughs> with some help from Mike and from Governor Belisles. we can let Barbara actually sit in her chair. <laughs> we made it really hard for it. There we go. <laughs> the Gordian knot. <laughs> Here we go. Get rid of that 
uh, that shallow replacement over there. <laughs> okay. And now for the main event. Uh, Professor Gordon Wood, uh, uh, this is truly an honor for me. Um, as I went on like a uh, the fan of a rock star in our session just before here, Professor Wood's influence on me has been extraordinary. When I was a graduate student, uh, getting my PhD in political thought and political history, his book, uh, The Creation of the American Republic, was probably the, the single most influential book on my dissertation. Um, and I couldn't find it this morning, but I found this stack <laughs> on my shelf. Um, first some biography and then a little bit about his impact and influence, not just on me, but on the country even to today. Uh, professor Wood is the Alva O. Way University Professor and Professor of History Emeritus at Brown University. He's also a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. He has a BA from Tufts University and a PhD from Harvard. Uh, and he's taught at Harvard, Michigan, and joined the faculty in, at Brown in 1969. Uh, that first book, The Creation of the American Republic, came out in 1969 and won the Bancroft Prize and the Dunning Prize in 1970. Uh, the Radicalism of the American Revolution uh, came out in 1992 as I was here living in Charlottesville on a Miller Center dissertation fellowship. Um, and it won the Pulitzer Prize for History and the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize in 1993. Uh, the Americanization of Ben Franklin in 2004 was awarded the Julie Award Howe Prize by the Boston Authors Club. Revolutionary Characters, What Made the Founders Different, that one, uh, came out in 2006. He's also written The Purpose of the Past, Reflection on the Uses of History, which I will come to in a minute as well as the volume in the Oxford History of the United States, Empire of Liberty, a history of the, early Republic, of the Early Republic, which was given the Association of American Publishers Award for History and Biography in 2009, and the American History Book Prize by the New York Historical Society in 2010. Um, boy, the list of awards goes on and on. The National Humanities Medal by President Obama, the Churchill Bell uh, by Colonial Williamsburg, the Arthur Schlesinger Award for American Historians, the Carter Brown Library, an award from the Carter Brown Library and the John F. Kennedy Medal from the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, it's, it's quite an extraordinary career, but what have we learned from Gordon Wood? Essentially everything that's essential. Um, <laughs> from the creation of the American Republic, I learned that popular sovereignty is one of the most complex confounding yet fundamental political ideas. Uh, in the 2,500 years since democratic thinking first appeared uh, in the West, Professor Wood captured the extraordinary range of debates happening across the country as we move from Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, including the ratification debates around the Constitution. If you think that's just a matter of history, think again. His book goes right to the heart of debates around original intent. So just to give you a taste, if that document really is of, by, and for the people, that is, if the act, or rather acts of ratification speak to the will of the people, then you see that that will was an amalgam of views and interests. Um, from the radicalism of the American Revolution, I learned, because I went back and looked at my notes in the book, <laughs> Uh, but I, I can see and understand a thread of thinking that goes right through debates today about the relationship of our democracy to monarchy. Um, he set in motion, uh, and uh, Professor Wood studied how the American Revolution set in motion an upending of some of the bedrocks, not just of our politics, but of society. The ramifications were deep. Old family orders based on the unified, absolute, and perpetual authority, not just of kings, but of fathers, was giving way to wives and children stepping forward and claiming 
their rights and duties. The control of the news, we were talking about it before, and of the truth itself was radically transformed. Federalists believed that there was one knowable truth. Republicans, including Jefferson, believed that there were contesting versions of the truth, and you had to have them battle it out to find out um, what was essential. Professor Wood's latest book on Jefferson and Adams couldn't be more timely. Uh, just to give you a taste, and I've not yet read the book and I can't wait to, but to give you a taste of what I'm looking for and how it applies today. We've just finished a contested elect election, a sloppy transition, a controversial outcome thanks both to our two century old institution, that is the Electoral College, as well as to the changes flashing through our politics and our society, including in the media, where we are rewriting political norms. But if you think that transition was sloppy, think again about Adams transferring power to Jefferson. It was arguably the first peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another ever in human history. Parties were new and they were not trusted. The federal government itself was a new creation. Who would stay, who would go? What norms would stay and what norms would go? Jefferson set in motion changes that remade the country. And as Professor Wood showed in Radicalism of the American Revolution, those same changes often surprised him and other founders who started out being radicals and end up being quite conservative. And yet still somehow Jefferson and Adams found a way to reconcile later in life. Many of, us, many of us know some of the elements of that story, including that both of them who had co-authored the Declaration of Independence, obviously Jefferson took the initial pen, but Adams was on the drafting committee. Um, and that those two men were able to reconcile so much that um, they died on the same day thinking about one another. But I'm sure in this book, we will learn a new lessons that will bring back those lessons to our life today. And with that, we are truly grateful to have Professor Gordon. Well, thank you, Bill, for that wonderful introduction. Um, well, as you mentioned, uh, these two guys, these two early presidents, second and third presidents, died on the same day. Uh, but it was just an ordinary day. It was July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years after the, uh, uh, the approval of the Declaration. It was a jubilee celebration of that Declaration. It was such a marvelous coincidence that uh, the nation took it to be providential. Uh, and I think this coincidence alone uh, has linked these two men forever in our national consciousness. But our memory and our celebration of the two men, the two patriots, has differed greatly. Until recently, Jefferson has dominated our uh, historical memory. Indeed, no figure, no figure in our past has embodied so much of our, so much of our heritage and so many of our hopes as Jefferson. Most Americans think of Jefferson uh, much as our first professional biographer, James Parton, did. If Jefferson was wrong, wrote Parton in 1874, America is wrong. If America is right, Jefferson was right. Now, no one says that about John Adams. Uh, indeed, until recently, few Americans paid much attention to Adams. And even now, the two men command very different degrees of affection and attention um, as founders. While Jefferson has hundreds, and you know this better than I, if not thousands of monographs devoted to every aspect of his wide-ranging life, Adams has had relatively few books written about him. Uh, with many of these, I think most of these, focusing on his apparently archaic political theory. Jefferson's mountaintop home here uh, has become a world heritage site visited every year by hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world. By contrast, Adams' modest home in Quincy, Massachusetts, maintained by the National Park Service, is hard to get to and receives only a fraction of Monticello's visitors. I just learned recently that uh, during the off-season, they close it on weekends. Uh, 
Jefferson has this huge memorial dedicated to him, located on the tidal basin just off the mall uh, in, the, in, in Washington. Adams, of course, has no such monument in, in our capital. In 1776, no American uh, could have predicted that the uh, reputations of these two men would so diverge. Indeed, at the time of independence, Adams was by far the more well-known of the two. No one had contributed more to the drive for independence than Adams. Jefferson admired Adams and shared his passion for independence, and the two, the two revolutionaries naturally uh, bonded, became good friends. During their missions abroad in the 1780s, their friendship was, was enriched, it was, in deep, was deepened. Then the French Revolution, partisan politics of the 1790s, strained their relationship. In 1796, Vice President Adams uh, succeeded Washington as president, with Jefferson elected at that time uh, as vice president. Adams assumed that he, like Washington, would be naturally elected, re-elected to a second term. When after the campaign, in 1800, probably the most scurrilous campaign in our, our history. Jefferson defeated Adams for the presidency. Adams was humiliated. And the break between the two former friends seemed irreparable. Now, actually, it's amazing that they became friends. Although they agreed on the significance of the revolution, they were very different from one another. Indeed, they were different in almost every fundamental way in temperament, in their ideas of government, in their assumptions about human nature, in their notions of society, in their attitudes towards religion, in the conception of America. Indeed, in every single thing that mattered, they differed from one another. Of course, what they did have in common was their deep and abiding hatred of Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> uh, they were physically very different, uh, a virtual, uh, veritable Mutt and Jeff. Uh, 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 there's some people here must remember Mutt and Jeff. Uh, Jefferson was tall, uh, perhaps 6'2 or so, and lean and gangly. He had a reddish freckled uh, complexion, bright hazel eyes, and a reddish blonde hair, which he tended to wear unpowdered in a queue. He bowed to everyone he met, and he usually talked with his arms folded. Uh, I think a sign of his reserved nature. By contrast, Adams was short, 5'7 or so, and stout. By my physical constitution, he admitted, I am but an ordinary man. He had sharp blue eyes, and he often uh, covered his uh, thinning light brown hair with, with a wig. William McClay, the caustic Scotch-Irish senator from Western Pennsylvania, had few kind words for anyone in his journal but he was especially contemptuous of Adams, who was vice president of the, uh, of the federal government in 1789 and thus president of the Senate. Adams wrote McClay was a childish man with a very silly kind of laugh, who was usually wrapped up in the contemplation of his own importance. Whenever uh, McClay looked at Adams, presiding in his chair with his wig and his small sword, McClay said he could not help thinking of a monkey just put into britches. Now, there's no doubt that Adams could sometimes appear ridiculous in the eyes of, of others. That was, I think, never true of Jefferson. Although Jefferson was often hated and ridiculed in print by his political enemies, no one made fun of Jefferson in quite the way they did Adams. Jefferson possessed a dignity that Adams lacked. Indeed, I think for, for many, Jefferson was the model of an 18th century gentleman learned and genteel, and possessing perfect self-control and serenity of spirit. By contrast, Adams was high-strung, irascible. He had no serenity of spirit whatsoever. And to his great regret, he lacked what he called the gift of silence. <laughs> Some, something possessed, I think, by both Washington and Jefferson. Jefferson hated personal confrontations and greatly valued politeness, treating even his enemies with grace and courtesy. Jefferson's extreme politeness, his acute sensitivity to the feelings of others, and his keen desire not to offend was the secret, I think, of much of his political success in life. But since his polite and good-humored behavior to people could never be an accurate expression of his real feelings, 
he was always open to accusations of duplicity or deceit, of being two-faced. Adams was the opposite. He was excitable and he had little of Jefferson's sense of restraint. He was, as his physician friend, uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, described him, fearless of men and of the consequences of a bold assertion of opinion in all his speeches. He had a sharp, sarcastic tongue, and he used it often, sometimes in the presence of the, of the recipient of his derision. Adams was not taken with politeness and hiding his feelings. He was, as Rush put it, a stranger to dissimulation, the very characteristic Jefferson was often accused of having. Because Adams never quite learned to tailor his remarks to his, to his audience in the way Jefferson did, he lacked Jefferson's suave and expert political skills. The two men had even more fundamental differences. Jefferson was, uh, as you all know, an aristocratic Virginia planter, a well-connected slaveholder, a patriarch, as he called himself, reared in a hierarchical slaveholding society. With the addition of his father-in-law's uh, land and slaves in, in the early 1770s, Jefferson became one of the wealthiest planters in Virginia. Although there was no one in America, and I include Franklin in that, no one in America, in North America, who knew more about more things than Jefferson, it was not his obvious intelligence and his learning that catapulted him into uh, leadership in the Virginia House of Burgesses. His political position flowed naturally from his, from his wealth and his social eminence. By contrast, Adams was middling born in a Massachusetts society that was far more egalitarian than any society in the South. Adams had few connections outside of his town of Braintree, and his rise was due almost exclusively to merit to his intelligence, his learning, and his hard work as an attorney. By the early 70s, 1770s, he'd become the busiest lawyer in the colony of Massachusetts and reasonably well off. But he never became one of the wealthiest members of, of that state society, Massachusetts society, and that was something that always rankled him. But even more important than these differences were their political differences. Jefferson was a radical a radical 18th century style liberal. But in his attitude towards government, he did, of course did not resemble a modern liberal. Convinced that people were naturally sociable, if only the government got out of the way, did not interfere, he believed in the least government possible. Now this was the progressive position, the radical position at the, at the time in the Anglo-American world, shared by Thomas Paine, William Godwin, the presumed author of <coughs> anarchism, and other Anglo-American radicals. Instead of the strong, modern, and integrated fiscal military state that Alexander Hamilton and other Federalists wanted to, uh, to create, Jefferson preferred a national government that resembled the Articles of Conf Confederation, which presumably had been scrapped in Philadelphia in 1787. Under Jefferson's administration, um, only the delivery of the mail reminded people that they had a federal government at all. Because Jefferson had a magnanimous view of human nature, he, like other radicals at the time, believed that society could virtually run by itself. He believed literally in what he wrote in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, in his case, only all white men, and that the obvious differences among individuals were due to the effects of the environment. I think a presumption that's still powerful in American culture today. In other words, nurture, not nature, was all important to Jefferson and to most other enlightened Americans at the time, including many Southern planters who even thought that black slaves, if brought up in the right environment, would be something other than what they were. Consequently, like most Americans today, especially progressives, Jefferson put an enormous, enormous emphasis on education, just as we do to today. Jefferson thought that educated, the educated American electorate, electorate would choose as its leaders only natural aristocrats, virtuous and talented men like himself. He was optimistic and believed that the world was getting better, becoming freer and more democratic, and that the new republic of the United States had a special role to play in furthering that future. America, he said, was a chosen country, 
and the world's best hope. It was Jefferson who created the American idea of exceptionalism. Despising monarchy, he became a true believer in the Republican revolutions that he hoped would spread everywhere in the world. His support for the French Revolution was unbounded and was worth all the bloodshed, all the lives lost in its name. If only an Adam and Eve were left alive in every country but left free, he wrote in 1793, it would be better than it is now. That comment led uh, Connor Cruz O'Brien, the Irish journalist and historian, uh, to call Jefferson the Pot Paul of the 18th century. Pot Paul being the Cambodian leader who killed millions of people on behalf of Marxism. Now the Federalist John Adams was very different. He was a conservative, perhaps the most conservative president we've ever had. But Adams was anything but a Ronald Reagan type conservative. He had a sour and cynical view of human nature. He was pessimistic about the future and a severe critic of the Jeffersonian conception of American exceptionalism. Adams said over and over that America was no different from other countries. Americans were just as vicious, just as sinful, just as corrupt as other nations. There was, he said, no special providence for the United States. Indeed, Adams was the ultimate realist, committed to what he called stubborn facts. He challenged every American dream, every American myth, especially the belief that all men are created equal. He believed that we were all born unequal, unequal, and that education could not do much about the inherent differences among people. He didn't know about genes and DNA, of course, but he certainly was convinced that nature not nurture, was what mattered most. He told Jefferson that he had visited a, foundation, a, a foundlings hospital in, in France and had observed babies who were only four days old. And he was struck by the great inequalities among these babies. Some, he said, were ugly, others beautiful. Some were stupid, others smart. <laughs> they were all born to equal rights, he said, but to very different future, to very different fortunes to very different degrees of success and influence in life, and it was there at birth, he said. Society would always be inherently unequal, and unlike Jefferson, he believed that the aristocrats who would inevitably rise to the top in Republican America would not necessarily be the best and wisest men. They were more apt to be the richest, the most attractive, the most ambitious, and the wiliest. Adams did not disparage big government as Jefferson did, but he did fear the unrestrained power of government. And perhaps the most profound statement he ever made, and surely I think his greatest contribution to American constitutionalism, he declared that power was never to be trusted without a check. Americans had little confidence in democracy and in the virtue of the American people. Consequently, he thought that sooner or later, America's elect elections would become so partisan so corrupt that we would have to turn to having office holders serve for life. Uh, he might have thought that we'd reached that point last, uh, last, last year. Eventually, he said, we would have to follow the example of England and make the presidency, the president, and the Senate hereditary to avoid the faction-ridden, corrupt nature of, of elections. Now, despite these obvious differences between the two political opponents, uh, there were bonds of friendship that ultimately, ultimately, I think, made their reconciliation possible. In 1812, as Adams' partisan passions uh, tended to fade, their earlier friendship was painstakingly uh, uh, restored, almost entirely through, all, entirely through the efforts of, of Benjamin Rush. He worked at it for two years to bring these two, uh, two great men, he thought, back together. Over the next 14 years, Adams and Jefferson exchanged over 150 letters with one another, with Adams writing uh, nearly two times as many letters as Jefferson. At some point, um, Adams wonders, maybe Jefferson's more busy than I am. And he asked him, he said, uh, how many letters did you get last year, Mr. Jefferson? And Jefferson said, this was 1820, he said, I received 1,200 and something letters. Uh, Adams was appalled. He had received 121 or something. In other words, a tenth. Jefferson, he realized immediately that Jefferson is in another 
category of celebrity status. Jefferson was an international superstar. He's, he's corresponding with the Tsar of Russia, with, with Alexander uh, uh, Humboldt, the great uh, German naturalist. Uh, Adams was out of his league. Uh, Adams was not in the same league as Jefferson. Jefferson made, I think, was crucial to making the reconciliation work. His characteristic courtesy, his politeness, his aversion to any sort of con confrontation saved it. Uh, Jefferson had the temperament to tolerate Adams's facetious and teasing manner. He need, Adams teased him endlessly. In 1815, of course, with the Napoleon defeated, the Bourbons, the Bourbons are back on the throne of France and Adams couldn't help ribbing Jefferson. What do you think of the French Revolution now, Mr. Jefferson? <laughs> Jefferson, polite as always, suffered all this razzing, uh, I think, in good humor. The two men valued their correspondence too much to endanger their, uh, their reconciliation, and thus they tended to avoid controversial subjects, especially slavery. But Adams always knew that the relationship was an unequal one. He always knew that he would never have the, the, the acclaim his fellow Americans, uh, f from his fellow Americans that Jefferson had and, and would, of course, continue to have. Adams may have been honest and realistic, telling us Americans what we needed to know, truths about ourselves that are difficult, if not impossible, to bear. But however true, however correct, however in accord with stubborn facts Adams' ideas and statements may have been, they were incapable of inspiring and sustaining the United States, or, or, or any nation for that matter. Since the traditional meaning of the term nation, the 18th century meaning, was a people with a common ancestry, a tribal meaning, Adams even doubted whether America could ever be a real nation. In America, he said, there was nothing like the patria of the Romans, the fatherland of the Dutch, or the patrie of the French. All he saw in America was an appalling diversity of religious denominations, diversity of ethnicities. In 1813, he counted at least 19 different religious sects in the country. We are such a hodgepodge of people, he concluded, such an omnium gatherum of English, Irish, German, Dutch, Swedes, French, etc., that it is difficult to give a name to the country characteristic of the people. By contrast, Jefferson's ideas and statements could inspire, I think, and, and nourish the diverse peoples of the United States. By the early 19th century, the Declaration of Independence, authored by Jefferson, had taken on a sacred, a sacred religious uh, kind of sig significance, something, of course, not anticipated in 1776 by either Jefferson or Adams. Adams, of course, was beside himself with jealousy at the acclaim Jefferson was getting for being the author of the Declaration. The author, the author, he said, he was the draftsman. <laughs> Adams, if Adams had known that it was going to become so important, he would have written it himself. <laughs> now, Abraham Lincoln, and there were others that earlier uh, that picked up this, but Abraham Lincoln is the one who came to realize just how important the Declaration had become. When he said in 1858, all honor to Jefferson, he paid homage to the one founder who he knew could explain why the breakup of the Union could not be allowed and why so many lives had to be sacrificed to maintain that Union. Lincoln knew what the Revolution had been about and what it implied, not just for Americans, but for all humanity because Jefferson had told him so. And Lincoln's talking about all of his speeches, of course, are made in the, in the uh, context of the failure of the revolutions of 1848. Uh, all these Republican revolutions in Germany, Italy, uh, France, all went wrong. And monarchy was still everywhere in Europe. And it's in that context that you can understand Lincoln's We Are the Last Best Hope. He realized that he could use the phrase in the Declaration that all men are created equal in order to make a nation out of an ethnically and racially diverse people who lacked a common, a common ancestry. In other words, Lincoln, I think, saw that he could justify a nation that was not, in any traditional sense, a nation. 
Half the American people, Lincoln said in 1858, had no direct blood connection to the founders of the nation. These German, Irish, French, and Scandinavian citizens either had come from Europe themselves or their ancestors had, and they had settled in America and amazingly had found themselves our equal in all things. Although these immigrants may have had no actual connection in blood with the revolutionary generation that could make them feel part of the rest of the nation, they had said Lincoln that old Declaration of Independence with this expression of the moral principle of equality to draw upon. This moral principle, which was applicable, he said, to, to all men and to all times, made all these different peoples one with the founders. And then he goes on with an image which is still, to me, uh, incredible. As though they were blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote that declaration. This emphasis on liberty and equality, he said, and then he shifts metaphor, was the electric cord that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together that will link these patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the minds of men throughout the world. Now, Lincoln could never have invoked Adams on behalf of his cause. Adams was too ornery, too contrarian, too cynical to offer any such support for America's nationhood. Adams had no answer whatsoever for the great problem of American diversity how the great variety of individuals in America with all their different ethnicities, their races, and religions could be brought together into one nation. But Jefferson did have an answer. As Lincoln grasped better than anyone, Jefferson offered Americans a set of beliefs that through the generations have supplied a bond that holds together the most diverse nation that history's ever known. A nation that has never been a traditional nation, which I think in our present world of movement, population movement, and immigration is our saving grace. Since now the whole world is in the United States, nothing but Jefferson's ideals can turn such an assortment of different individuals into one, the one people that the Declaration says we are. To be an American is not to be someone, but to believe in something. And that something is what Jefferson declared. That's why we honor Jefferson, not Adams. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, for Professor Wood. Um, I'm going to moderate um, our Q&A session today. Um, I have a few questions I want to throw out, but before I do, I, I just wanted to say that I, I just met Professor Wood, though I feel as though I know him through his work and uh, his appearances on television over the years. Um, and when I came into our council room to, to meet him, he said, ah, you do the modern presidency. And I said, yes, that's right. Um, but I do love learning about um, the founding presidents, um, not only because they were the early presidents, but they were the founders of our nation and our constitution, and they were the very founders of our presidency, either by having written parts of the Constitution uh, that relate to the presidency or by having served so early in the presidency that they created these precedents uh, that we perhaps still follow to this day. Um, but this also then to me is the essence of the Miller Center um, so that we study at the Miller Center uh, not only just the presidents but we place them into this constitutional history and our founding. And this is exactly what Mr. White Burkett Miller who founded the Miller Center, our founder, our personal founder here, wanted us to do. He wanted us to understand our constitutional system, our system of government, how it operates, how we can preserve it, um, particularly by studying the, the presidency. Um, I have a waggish brother who says that maybe one day on one of my books on the back where you see those testimonial blurbs, someone will write, I couldn't put it down, but I haven't <laughs> achieved that yet. Um, but if I was, if I would be asked to write something along those lines for this particular book, Friends Divided, it would be that. Um, because I keep thinking to myself, I'll just read a few pages before I go to bed, and then a half an hour later, I'm still, it is literally a page turner. So if you haven't read it yet, please go to it. Um, so I have a whole list of questions, but we want to have your questions as well. And so while you're pondering those, um, I will throw out a couple. 
Uh, the first one is a specific question about a topic that Professor Wood addresses in his book about a specific difference between uh, Jefferson and Adams. And then I have a more general question related to the, the theme of the book. So the first one is about religion. Uh, you spend a number of pages talking about how Jefferson and Adams approached religion, uh, how they had their different faith traditions. Um, so first of all, can you tell us about those differences between these two men on religion, and then on how church and state relations in this country might have been different if the Jeffersonian, Madisonian, I'll add George Mason, Masonic theories of church and state, that very Virginia-based theory of church and state, had not informed our First Amendment, but rather Adam's approach to religion had done so. Well, yes, both men were uh, essentially Unitarians in belief. That is to say, they both denied the divinity of, of Jesus. Um, that, that was, I think, increasingly common among so-called enlightened people at the time. But um, uh, Adams had a respect for religion uh, and other people's religion in a way that Jefferson did not. Jefferson really was uh, scornful of organized religion and made a couple of comments in public that, that caused him a lot of trouble. One was in the Notes of Virginia where he said, oh, what does it matter if my neighbor believes in one god or 20 gods? It doesn't break my leg. Well, that got him into a lot of trouble because a lot of Americans <laughs> didn't think that that, that was true. And then he, in his um, preface, um, his preamble to his Bill for Religious Freedom, which is, uh, I think, the important document you're talking about, is uh, he says, uh, our religious opinions, he didn't even say faith, our religious opinions have no more importance on our civic life than our opinions about, I don't know, geometry and physics. Well, that too was not something Americans uh, at the time accepted and, and they caused him a lot of trouble. So he learned enough to keep quiet about religion publicly, but privately he had nothing but contempt for the hocus pocus of of the Trinity, for example, and he thought that was, well, Adams was very different. He was very respectful of other people's religion and uh, was interested in it. Uh, and, and he was a very sensuous man. And one of the great uh, letters he writes to Abigail is when he goes to a Catholic church in Philadelphia, he had never been to a Catholic cathedral. And he's kind of overawed by the whole process, although he's full of the standard uh, Puritan contempt or, or <laughs> scorn for, for Roman Catholicism, he nonetheless was uh, deeply impressed and he describes in uh, graphic terms to Abigail what he saw in, in a mass, a, a Catholic mass. And then he ends with this great line. He says, how did Luther ever break the spell? Uh, <laughs> so Adams has a, has a kind of uh, grudging respect for organized religion, even though, even though himself doesn't, doesn't differ from, from uh, the Unitarian beliefs of, of Jefferson. Jefferson was naive about the future. He said as late as 18, I think 1821, there's not a young man now alive who won't die a Unitarian. This is in the middle of the Second Great Awakening when the Baptists and Methodists are sweeping through the country, and he thinks the Unitarians are taking over? Uh, a symptom, I think, an example of his, of his innocence, in a way. So how would our views of church and state well, constitutionally be different well, if Adams had prevailed rather than Jefferson? Adams would not have written the bill for, he, he later declared that he was not responsible for Article 3 of the Massachusetts Constitution, which uh, continued the established church, the Puritan Congregational Church in, in Massachusetts well into the 1830s. Uh, but uh, he was certainly, I, I think, more sympathetic to it than he later declared. Uh, so we would have not had, I mean, that bill for religious freedom is a really radical document, uh, radical for, at the time even, uh, and was successful. Madison is the one who engineered it through the Virginia legislature uh, because it, uh, his, his friend Jefferson was abroad as minister to France. Uh, and Madison, Jefferson from, from afar thought, oh my God, my fellow citizens have become enlightened and they've, they've adopted this bill, my wonderful bill. But Madison knew better. He says, look, it wouldn't have gotten through if it hadn't been for the jealousy of the different groups. You know, if the Presbyterians who could have been assured of being the established church, they would have gra <laughs> gladly taken it. But there were so many. There were Baptists, Methodists, uh, Presbyterians, Quakers. 
and they all uh, felt that we can't trust anyone to take over, so better to neutralize the state in religious matters. That is an extraordinary uh, step taken and not duplicated anywhere in the world at the time. Uh, and, and it set us off on a path that we now have separation of church and state, which other states in effect in Europe do have, uh, although there's still an established church in, in, uh, in, in England and, and in one in Italy and so on, but they're not flourishing. But our step in 1785, 86 was, was truly radical and Jefferson uh, and Madison were the ones who engineered that. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, now, now to my more general question before we take yours. So, uh, Professor Wood, your book concludes with a reference to Adams's pessimism, which you explained to us today, um, in an assessment that, as you write, you say America's future was as likely to be tragic as well as comic. For, said Adams, we have no patent of exemption from the common lot of humanity an understanding of his view of human nature. Yet Jefferson's star power, in contrast to Adams' eclipse by history, results from Jefferson's offer to Americans of what you call a set of stirring ideals that has carried them and their country through all of their many ordeals. So I put to you, you have Adams' realistic tragedy comedy uh, bifurcation of what he sees as the future of America. And you have Thomas Jefferson's idealistic inspiration. How do these two oppositional visions of the United States and indeed human nature inform what America has become? I think Jefferson has trumped uh, Adams. That's all. No pun intended, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we, we remain terribly optimistic. Now we have these moments where we feel things aren't right, but, and we had this tremendous confidence in education. And, and despite all of the evidence we have about uh, genetics and so on, I think we continue to believe that all men are created equal. Uh, and that the differences, we know that everyone's different. They did too, they weren't blind to the differences of people, but that's a product of the environment of the way they were raised. If you could change that environment, if you can change that educational process, then things can be different. Uh, the, the differences can be e e evened out. Uh, that, I think, remains an American uh, position, and, and it's a healthy position. Um, Adams' is, is not. Adams' is, is pessimistic. You can't do much about it. We're all gonna be unequal, and what's the point? Uh, that's not an American belief. And, and I think that would have led us down a very different, there may be nations in the world that think like that, but we don't. And we, of all of, all of the uh, democratic nations, are the most optimistic in that and, 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 and spend more on education than any other nation, uh, maybe not as efficiently as, as other nations, but certainly we do spend more. And, and we're dedicated to that. And that, I think, is what what makes Jefferson's uh, assumptions, which are the Enlightenment assumptions. Uh, Jefferson was not unique. I mean, he, he, when he said, I, all men are created equal, he didn't see that he was saying anything original because uh, most of his colleagues would have said the same thing. What's incredible uh, to the late 18th century are these, this enlightened optimism that people have that um, the, the, the culture, that men, this is really the, what the Enlightenment is about, That that culture is, is self-created, that we, we can create ourselves. Uh, we're not born to be, uh, to be whatever. That, that would have been the ancien regime review. There's no sense doing anything, no sense worrying about the, the herd, the common herd out there, because they're doomed to be like the, like the cows in the field. Uh, the, the assumption that the Enlightenment has, and, and I think it is still the American assumption, is that uh, everyone, can be transformed. Uh, culture is, 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 uh, is created by us. And that, I think, is what's new about the 18th century and makes it modern. And, and uh, we've been living off that ever since. Um, we don't want to go back to a Nazi on regime belief that, uh, that Adams essentially was expressing. Look, you're born to be what you are and don't worry about it. That's the way it is. I think that's not a message that's American. 
Well, my colleague Christina, and we want to thank her for putting together this wonderful program today, um, will come around to you with a microphone, so just raise your hand and wait for the mic to come. Uh, yes, Christine, I think right here, this lady right here in the middle. Um, and if we'll just ask you to, like on Jeopardy, put your statement in the form of a question, we would appreciate it. <laughs> my question is, as a great admirer of Abigail Adams, I'm very curious uh, to what extent her, her influence on him politically, because I think he, she would have made a great first president. But, <laughs> well, uh, I, I think Abigail, of course, was a very unusual. Uh, and, and Jefferson came to realize that. Um, she, she was smart, uh, self-educated, and she set about to read almost everything she didn't have the languages that, that her husband had, but she set out to read almost everything he read. And she loved to quote, uh, some often from memory, Milton and Shakespeare and, and historians, uh, so that she could match her husband. And, and she, was, she was just terrific. Now, the relationship with Jefferson is interesting because he, he's never met anybody like Abigail. I mean, his own relationship was patriarchal to his own wife. I mean, she, she played the... She played music and, and, and sang, and, and uh, she could uh, do feminine things, but he never thought she or any woman had any say in politics. But Mrs. Adams had political views. She was very tough-minded. She was probably, uh, she's the one who really urged uh, John to support the Alien Sedition Acts. She, she was really out ahead of him in, in her tough-mindedness in dealing with the, these, these Republicans who were, uh, uh, a, uh, a threat to the nation. Um, uh, uh, so Abigail, what's interesting is that in the relationship, uh, Jefferson actually flirted with her in his limited way. He, for example, he was buying presents for her. When they moved to London, he would send her things and she would send things back to him. And at one point she, he writes, I, was, I saw a little statue of Venus that I was going to send to you, but then I realized two such Venuses in the dining room would be too much. <laughs> uh, and that's his, he, he, he actually, uh, he, he was taken with her managerial ability. She managed the household. She managed to balance the budget. He just couldn't, he, he was just overawed by, by Abigail. Uh, but obviously, the, the, the relationship was broken. Uh, but Abigail wrote to him in 1804. It might have turned out to be something. She wrote a letter of condolence because uh, Polly, uh, Jefferson's daughter, died uh, as an adult. And Polly had been the little girl that uh, Abigail had hosted along with Sally Hemings when um, the, she arrived in London on her way to join her father in France. And, and so she knew Polly very well as a kid. And, and, and so she writes a letter of condolence. And, and Jefferson's touched by this. And he, I think he assumed that this meant that the relationship was really back on track and that he could write back. And he writes back a very warm letter. But then he makes this terrible mistake of saying, look, your, your husband and I have, have, have agreed on almost everything. There's only one thing that I objected to about his administration. It was the appointment of those midnight judges. <laughs> Well, that sent Abigail off. <laughs> oh my God, she goes off in, in, in a rant against uh, defending her husband. Jefferson tries to answer, and uh, she comes back even harsher, and finally he just gives up and wondered. But if he had not made that one criticism, I think that might have led to something, and the reconciliation might have occurred much earlier through, through this correspondence. John wrote, wrote later on the bottom of one of the letters, I never knew about what my wife was doing here in this <laughs> uh, I was pleased a couple of weeks ago um, that Abigail Adams was recalled again uh, in the media and in our popular culture um, when Barbara Bush passed away. They are, of course, the, remain the only two first ladies who produced a son who became that's president right, right. of the United States. So that's interesting, too. All right, other questions? Uh, yes. If you can hold for the mic. No, no, we need to have here, you do the microphone for our online. We want to make sure everyone around the world can hear your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, given the divergent uh, views of human nature of Jefferson and Adams and their role in shaping the, the republic, uh, 
Can you speak to what you know, your views of their influence on the debate around slavery, where those two divergent views really seem to come clashing into one another, and we're still playing out right. in many ways today? They they tried to avoid. I mean, they didn't mention slavery until very late in their correspondence. 1819, the Missouri crisis uh, obviously disturbed Jefferson terribly. Fire bell in the night, and so on, and and uh, it comes up. Uh, Adams. You know, he was very indiscreet most of the time, and he razzed Jefferson about everything, but he never razzed him about slavery. He knew that was a sensitive subject. And he more or less says to Jefferson, Jefferson you guys, you planters, you southern slaveholding planters, it's your problem, and I'm going to leave you to solve I'm not going to be a critic of what you should do. You're going to have to solve it. Uh, but, of course, privately, he's saying to his uh, northern friends, thank God I don't own slaves. And I think for the first time in history, uh, he sees himself, uh, as we would say, on the right side of history, that he knows that this um, issue is going to break the nation if anything does. And they talk about that, the possibility of the Union breaking apart. Uh, Jefferson's well aware of it. His, his correspondence from 1819, 1820 on to the last six years of his life is pretty pessimistic. Uh, and I think as the retirement series is being published and, and, and it becomes more publicly aware, I think people are going to be shocked at how, how, how Jefferson takes uh, the, the, the crisis. He, he's really become, becomes very, his, his language becomes very similar to a, a fire-eating southerner of the 1850s in defense of the South, defense of its, um, its system. Uh, he's scared. He's scared about what's going to happen, and, and he becomes, um, I think, a different kind of person. I mean, his letters, everything, you see a, a, a real loss in confidence uh, that he had much earlier, uh, whereas Adams actually gets uh, a little more confident. Uh, he's being celebrated uh, by his fellow Massachusetts people, and he, he even though he's had trouble with his, his kids, his two, two sons, his son, of, his eldest son, of course, gets, one of them uh, dies of alcoholism, the other one comes home and uh, a failure. Uh, but John Quincy becomes president of the United States, and, and that, of course, uh, makes all the difference for him. So he's, he's, he's feeling pretty excited. John Quincy's election um, uh, scares Jefferson. He doesn't say this to Adams, but he's worried about Adams had a, John Quincy Adams had a proposal for internal improvements, uh, as they called them, uh, uh, building roads and canals. With the federal government doing this, uh, Jefferson is really scared. He says, if they can do that, of course, they can, the federal government can do anything, can interfere with slavery and interfere with our, uh, our, our, our system. So uh, he's very much opposed to, and he wants to issue a, a proclamation and he writes to Madison, we've got to, we, the state of Virginia, has got to issue a proclamation condemning this. And Madison had a cooler head, and he says, look, don't do anything. This will die of its own weight. Uh, and, and it does, of course. And so he, he avoids Jefferson getting out in front on this issue. It, it's a, slavery is, is something they don't push. Um, and Jefferson's position is really... Uh, despairing at the end, and, and uh, it, it's it's a sad time in his life. Uh, in your research for this book, what was the biggest surprise? Uh, what did you learn that you didn't know? I didn't realize, first of all, how important the notion, although I should have, uh, that um, all men are created equal, how, how much of a, an enlightened premise that was and what it represented. And then, of course, to see Adams um, taking it on so directly. I mean, he just couldn't get over that. He just wanted to, and he's alone in that. There's almost, uh, nobody publicly comes out the way he does. He, he you know, this little issue about he, this founding hospital. He writes that to a lot of people, to John Taylor, to Jefferson and others. He wants to get across that, look, uh, we're not born equal. We're born unequal. And he wants to, he's just angry that we're not facing reality. Uh, that came as a shock to me. Um, and, and I think it, it's, um, it, it, I came to realize why Jefferson 
is celebrated in a way that, that Adams is not. That, that's a crucial moment because we don't, we don't believe that. And, and I don't think we ought to. And that's, I guess, is, is the other issue I would. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Christine, up here. Thank you. I, I might say something about this founding thing that, you know, Lincoln is the one who really rescues the notion of the founders. Uh, this hasn't been properly appreciated. Uh, for the antebellum period, most people talked about the founders. They meant John Smith, William Bradford, William Penn, <laughs> the 17th century founders. It's the, it's Lincoln, uh, essentially, I think, and others, is, but, but Lincoln, essentially, who, from the Civil War on, the Founding Fathers become the people we call the Founding Fathers. And, and what's interesting to me is why we, as a nation, celebrate these people who are 200 years ago. I mean, I, the English don't say, you know, William Pitt said this, <laughs> and that's why we should follow this policy. There's no, no sense in the English rhetoric of looking back to their 18th century characters, who are very important, mm -hmm. William Pitt and William Pitt the Younger, the two Pitts were really important politicians, but nobody looks back the way we do. And, and I think that in itself is a curious fact. <laughs> Go ahead. I'd like you to speak to the fact that more than religion, the concept of God was totally disparate between the two men. And Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he cited the God, it's the only time God is mentioned in our founding that I've found, God of nature. Right. And the whole concept of consent and civil rights come from the Enlightenment and the God of nature, not the God of Nicaea that uh, Jefferson, I mean, um, Adams believed in. And I never, I, I've read your book, and I've read every book I can find on our founding, and I never find religion and God. God is such a disparity. Look, I, I, let's just say, look, nobody that I know at the time, no enlightened person, was an atheist. Thomas Paine, who was as antagonistic to Christianity, he called it a joke. Uh, he, was a, he was a believer in God. So God is, is taken for granted. There's nobody, Jefferson is not an atheist. Uh, neither, and what's more interesting is that they both seem to believe in a hereafter. Adams certainly does, but Jefferson does too. In a way, at, at least he makes remarks to suggest that, which strikes me as uh, incredible, given his uh, general contempt for organized uh, Christian religion. So um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, I find that the idea that you can believe in a hereafter and not be a, a, a devout Christian seems to be contradictory, but anyway. But it, then nobody's an atheist. I don't know of any atheists in the Enlightenment. Yes. Ladies first. Phil Williams, congratulations, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> could you talk a little bit or comment on, you know, the, the, the practical, cynical Adams versus the radical idealist Jefferson? I'd like to have you talk a little bit about Jefferson the radical Jefferson the president, uh, and then Jefferson returning more to a, a radical garb. Uh, when I think of the predations of the Barbary Coast, for example, or right. Louisiana Purchase, you find uh, Jefferson becoming more practical uh, and realistic as, as a president than he might have been before he arrived in that office or after he left that office, which is often the case from our presidents when they finally get to the White House. Right. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, I think that that's obviously a point that many people have said, and I suppose uh, anybody who's a theorist who gets into office is found, finds uh, practicalities take over. What, what's incredible to me is how much he tried to implement his theories uh, on the Louisiana Purchase. That was his dream, fulfilled all that territory, doubling the size of the United States. They would have land forever, it seemed, uh, so that his yeoman farmers could, could and yet he, he almost screws it up by saying, well, well you got to have a constitutional amendment because the government can't, we can't do this by treaty. And Gallatin and Madison say to him, my God, Mr. Jefferson, are you out of your mind? Napoleon's going to change his mind. You'll lose the whole thing. <laughs> and, and he, you know, he delays. He almost screws it up because of his theory that you can't, the federal government shouldn't be able to do this. 
So I, then take the uh, his notion about how war should be handled. Now, you're right about the pirates. Uh, he felt we could deal with those because we didn't need to uh, have a big army or big navy. Uh, and in fact, he had these six frigates, which had been created by Adams uh, in the crisis of 1798. And therefore, he could use these ships to the, the, to uh, deal with them by force instead of buying them off. Adams actually was took the view that the English and French did, look, just pay these guys off and they'll leave us alone. Uh, Jefferson didn't want to do that. He felt that was uh, immoral or unethical and we should not do that. Uh, so he was willing to use force but because it, these were puny enemies and he had these ships to, that he could use, ironically, uh, Adams's uh, creation. But most of his shipbuilding were gunboats that would never be used offensively. Now, when he comes to the um, embargo, he had this notion, which was a radical notion at the time, that war is so horrible and, and feeds monarchy, and kings live off war, uh, therefore we should do everything we can to avoid war. Now, we have the same feeling, and we have economic sanctions. Well, that's what the embargo is. He's going to use economic power and of course, he inflated the power of the United States, the commercial power of the United States. Withholding all American trade would bring uh, England, particularly England, uh, to, to its knees. Now he was wrong about that, and it, it, it just killed off commerce in New England uh, in a terrible way. Uh, but he clung to that for, what, 18 months? Because he said, it's a liberal experiment. If we can make this work, we can change the nature of warfare. We'll have, we'll, this will be the weapon of the future, and, and people won't be killed. It's a, a, a liberal dream. Uh, so what impresses me about his presidency is how much he clings to these, these dreams. Now, he, he does back away. He does uh, support the Louisiana Purchase, because God forbid that if he let that lost that, that would have just been terrible in his mind. But I would turn it around and say how much he tried to cling to his belief, especially in, in office holding. You know, he reduces the power of government. He, he you know, the, the Defense Department, well, the War Department, uh, he thought it was overinflated. I mean, they had, I don't know, 14 clerks and one, one one Secretary of War, and, and he thought that was too much. <laughs> the Army was, was 3,000. He said, that's too much. We've got to put them out in the West anyhow. And, and, and he just was obsessed with cutting um, the, the, the federal government. Uh, so I, I, I think that the administration, he, doesn't, he isn't a fanatic, uh, and, and he does make these concessions. But I would say that I would, I'm more impressed with the way he t attempts to implement his, his radical uh, liberal notions. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Um, Christina, do I remember correctly that we have books available? We do. So in the ante room, we have uh, Professor Wood's Friends Divided book available. He's kindly agreed to sign them for you, and I'm sure if you have some individual questions for him, you can approach him there. So if I can ask you to let him exit the room so he can get seated, so he can sign books, we'd so appreciate it. Before that, though, please give him a hearty round of applause. Thank you very much.